So our, ne our next panel is going to be in English again, so we'll switch languages, and it will focus on the European perspective. Holger Lösch will be the moderator. He's BDI's Deputy General, uh, Director General, and we'll take over from here. Mr. Lösch. Thank you, and uh, thank you for being here. I mean, if BDI, Federation of German Industries, is doing a climate congress, there's a slight chance of a national bias. Uh, and with our last panel, we would like to open again, it has been open in many panels, the, the perspective on Europe. In Europe is our continent, Europe is uh, our project for peace, for prosperity, and of course it is our um, room for chances uh, to create a climate neutral continent. We all know that the um, present uh, commission under Ursula von der Leyen has made this a very strong case. It has put it at the core of the European strategy, the European Green Deal. Uh, then we had, of course, the Ukraine crisis and uh, a complete crash of the European energy system, especially on the molecules. So it was a, a period of a lot of uncertainty. And Sometimes if we talk in Brussels, what we do a lot, you have the impression that everybody knows that Europe can really be the place for the space for chances and for scale. And, um, and then you always get the impression, oh, are we doing enough? Is this a chance we are using enough? And this is something I would like to discuss on this last panel of our BDI Climate Congress. Um, I am very happy to have here four very renowned experts from the business and uh, from politics and the think tank. So my first guest, and I would ask you all up here now, my first guest is Mechtil Worsdorfer. She is the um, Deputy uh, General, um, Director General for Energy. Ms. Kadri Simpson, welcome. Thank you for coming here. Then we have uh, Andre Marco. Andre Marco is is a yeah founder and CEO of a think tank in Brussels, and he has a remarkable network and a lot of knowledge about what is going on on energy and climate in Brussels. Then we have uh, Gilles Levon. Gilles Levon is vice president, large industries and energy transition, Central Europe for Air Liquide. Welcome. And then last but not least, uh, we have uh, Markus Lesser. He's the CEO of PE. PE is a, a project manager for anything in terms of clean tech, green tech, and so on. So he's from the very practical side. He tries to do projects on green tech all over Europe. And thank you all for coming. Well, um, I would start with you, Mrs. Wersurfer. Um, so, the von der Leyen presidency ends next year. We are going to have uh, EU uh, parliamentarian elections in June. And then, from all experiences, it's going to take a few months to have a new uh, commission. And uh, uh, so we are entering a period where we really can, can look back a little bit what happened under von der Leyen 1 let's call it von der Leyen 1, uh, not knowing if there's going to be a von der Leyen 2 or whoever won. Um, but Europe is looking back on, on a very dramatic year. So we had clearly the, the Green Deal, as I already said, at the core of the European strategies. And then we had last year, one and a half years ago, we had uh, the, the, the crash, the disruption of the Ukrainian war. We had... Uh, uh, a lot of uncertainty, are we going to have enough energy? We had to change a lot of things. Um, so if you're looking from today's perspective, so what do you think has been or are the lessons the European Commission or Europe uh, uh, has learned from, from this going very strong on a green deal and then having this disruption on, on resilience on security of supply last year? So what are your major takeaways? First of all, thank you for inviting me here. And I think uh, last year's crisis was definitely unprecedented. So we have never seen that 
in the, for decades in energy policy or more general caused, as you said, by the invasion of Russia and Ukraine. What we can learn is, first of all, we managed to go through that crisis of security of supply and energy prices relatively well and together. So as an example, we made five emergency legislation proposal in record time. Normally it takes six to 12 months to prepare legislation, 12 to 18 months to adopt it. Now we had sometimes three weeks for demand reduction, for example, uh, an emergency legislation, and it was adopted by all the 27 EU energy ministers in 27. So it was an emergency temporary legislation, but all that packages together helped. There was no blackout. There was solidarity among member states. Prices, we heard a little bit throughout the day, but energy prices are still of a concern. I can obviously agree to that. But we are in a completely different world compared to last year, August, end of August, on gas prices and on electricity. So I think for me, the main lessons is that Europe can act together in a crisis, which was unprecedented. We have to learn how to prepare better. So we have also some of the more temporary um, uh, permanent legislation still under negotiations right now. And I think in terms of energy prices, which is obviously a, one of the major concerns for industry or energy intensive, we still have to look what more can we do. And that is what we are preparing now. You referred to the President von der Leyen's speech uh, two weeks ago. For example, we want to come up in a month's time, more or less, with what we call a wind package to look what is needed for the wind industry, for example. So I think we, we, we learn that we can our internal market works, we have interconnections, we have acted together, but there are still things we can do much better and uh, that we are tackling right now. Thank you. So what we take away now is obviously, and, and this was something we've seen in Germany as well, if there is disruptive action, if there's a crisis, there is fast action possible. I, I, I would like to take in uh, Andre. Andre, you are watching all of this energy and climate policy from many perspectives over, over decades now. Um, so if you would have to draw a balance sheet for von der Leyen 1, let's call it like this, uh, what do you think is uh, on the positive side? And uh, what do you think should be really changed to gain or to keep this momentum we've seen at times in the crisis uh, for the transformation ahead of us? in the next commission. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Holger, for in inviting me. I didn't talk to you before to ask you how provocative I can be, but I think this is the end of the road, so I mean, there's not that many people I can probably say a few things. But seriously speaking now, yes, it has been... We live in an interesting time, so to speak, and sometimes we have too much of, of interest in time. Maybe it's a little bit boring. It's not, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have. Uh, clearly, Look, I'm an electrician, way back, somewhere. I'm an electric engineer. I used to work for a power company in Canada. I used to be in Essen every month with RWE. And, and so I, I know a little bit about electrification and, 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 and power and competitiveness. I think this, the, the one thing that we, we need to think about is the fact that we set up to change the world. Now, changing the world is always a very ambitious project. But changing the world, I also used to work about for a man who was the Secretary General of the Rio Conference in 92, and he told me about sustainable development. Sustainable development on three axes, on environment, economy, and social. So we changed the way, set to change the world in a sustainable way. And the organization I lead has a very long name, on, but has sustainable transition in it. So the one thing that we, we learned is that we we set up to change the world, but the world was not the same as the one that we set to change. Because there's a lot of changes from the moment that we triggered this. In Rio 92, then, you know, there was a, we didn't do that much for many years, and now for, we try to do in an accelerated way. But when we started, a lot of, a lot of the, 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 let's remember that the energy crisis didn't start with the war in Ukraine. The energy crisis was, had started before. And the one thing that we, I think, was very well done is that we really had the courage to do it. 
and it was something necessary, something that I'm not a scientist, but science tells us that's what we need to do, and we had to get to do it. So that is positive. And we looked at this in the point of view is this is going to be a competitive advantage for Europe and European industry. That was that the gutsy thing, that the thing to do. And we managed to work miracles. I mean, you know, going through this crisis was a minor miracle. What I would say that we learned from it is the fact that we went very strong on the environmental side of the house, on the very, very strong way. But I think that the economic and potentially the just transition side were maybe not at quite at the same level as that. And that one of the reasons of that is that we started by decarbonizing electricity, which is, you know, as an electrician, is not a simple thing to do, but it's not competitive and, you know, you at the edges, Morocco and the Western Balkans and what have you. But now we got into decarbonizing industry. So at this point, it is a very different game. So we need to understand that the transition that the power in, 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 in uh, in power and the one that's taking uh, place in industry now are very, very different. So this is a lesson that we need to take and a lesson that we need to reflect upon. On the social justice point of view, it is a command performance. It is not something that we decided to do because of economic, it's a market failure. We're doing this because of, of government uh, dictat in a way. So we need, we need to recognize that and we need to make sure that we carry everybody with us. A lot of efforts are being made, but I think that we have a lot left to do. Thank you, Andre. Gilles Levon, uh, you are French and German. Uh, you are living in Germany. You, yeah, I know, in Dusseldorf. Uh, so you're working for a, for a French but very international company, El Liquid. Um, and, and of course, we've seen last year there was a lot of um, working together to, to get the crisis uh, managed. But on the other hand, we've seen enormous uh, cracks inside the EU, especially between France and Germany. So question on the Doppelwumms. Uh, it was a very funny day when, when I was at uh, the Industrial Affairs Committee of Business Europe and our government proclaimed uh, 200 billion Doppelwumms and the other members of the EU uh, the BE looked at me and said, are you serious? Um, and then, of course, nuclear power. So, from your perspective, so uh, Elikid is doing a, a lot of projects, and of course, you can look at both countries and all over Europe, and of course, globally as well. So, uh, do you think we miss a lot of potential in Europe um, um, when it comes to tr transforming the continent together in a competitive way, transforming our energy system, and what could we change to make it, to use this potential more? Yes, so hello everybody and thank you for having me. Yes, uh, very easy questions you ask. <laughs> I'll try to, to answer uh, uh, not too long, but I, I think first of all, I would like to say that uh, indeed this unprecedented uh, situation that we faced in, in uh, 22, uh, early 22, the dramatic war in, in Ukraine when it started, and, and indeed the, the energy situation started mid-21 to, to already be a little bit uh, worrying for us in the industry. But I, I, I would like to say that I think um, in Germany and, and in other countries as well, the governments have reacted to in all in all pretty well. I, I have to say that uh, uh, we in the industry, we, we, have, we can talk about collateral uh, damages, about high energy prices, uh, lots of reduction in production that we had to face and to, to, to do to be able to uh, cope with the situation. But all in all, it went, it went okay. Um, so I think we need to acknowledge that. But we were lucky. And in the same time, we need to, to see that some things, uh, you were saying maybe we need to get prepared for, for other things, and I, I do believe so as well, but I would even wish to go even one step further, to say not only be prepared, but be proactive in embracing what is coming ahead of us and see how we can use it as an opportunity to really get to the next level. 
what I mean by that is that indeed you, you talked about it, that today we have, um, and, and I think the title is about the diversity in our energy systems, and you talked about uh, the obvious elephant in the room between France and, and Germany and, and a few others. Um, about the, the nuclear, but there are a few other topics of, of uh, I would say, uh, disagreement, uh, let's call it this way. But nevertheless, if you look at, at it from an objective point of view, and you see that today we have an energy mix in Europe that is quite resilient by itself, and it proved to be resilient when we were in distress. We were able suddenly to manage and to export, import, and, and have a resilient system. So my question is, why do we need to be in this situation to work together? Why can we not, out of strength, see how can we use it to go to the next level? But to be able to do that, we need probably to overcome some certain beliefs and find a way to agree on a certain denominator. And if we look at uh, different countries in the, in the world, I like to call them our competitors, not rivals or not uh, enemies, but competitors, you see that they all look at low carbon energy. And what they try to do is develop low carbon and competitiveness of the industry <coughs> to gain new value chains. And this is, I believe, on, I, I know I'm not the only one, this is what we, where we need to go. We need to transform our value chains. This is a great opportunity, but for that we need to look how to work together to create this competitiveness in Europe. Yeah, very interesting. I think uh, if you look at the land map of Europe, it really sp springs upon you how many potential we have there in terms of renewables, in terms of, of uh, green hydrogen, in terms of industry and so on. So this is something we're going to um, talk a bit later. Um, yeah, Mr. Lesser, so p and &E, so you are a, a large project manager, wind, solar, um, all green tech, I would say, mostly green tech. So if you look at your European business, just so we talked before, you said, so I'm the, the guy from, from the practical part. Um, if you look at what you're doing in, in, in Europe, what could you do a lot more? And what is hindering you in doing a lot more? What should change to make this potential being um, open? Yeah, first of all, if you look to Europe, we see a very fragmented market. So every country has its own uh, regulations. We have, uh, we counted it one year, 150 changes, we are in 15 countries, 150 changes in regulations in one year. So, and we have to start project development usually five to eight to 10 years ahead. So we develop projects, green projects uh, uh, in, all, in all areas, and uh, we also look for hydrogen. So if we do this, we have to see that this permitting times, depending on the country, in Germany is three to five years. If you start a project, so you need five to seven years. In Poland, maybe two years longer. In France, two years longer. So I'm always a little bit surprised when I heard about the targets. I think, okay, we do a lot in advance, <coughs> but who will come up with this green energy? Nevertheless, we do everything in advance because we see the markets upcoming and we look for each country in a different way. So, for example, in, uh, uh, in, uh, you have countries where you have, an, if you look to the energy price development, you have total other developments as in Germany or because you're not connected. So infrastructure is a, is a, is a, is a big value for Europe if you, if, if you ask me what could be improved, yeah, infrastructure. When we see the grid situation, a lot of constraints we have is access to grid. So, so it's not only the permission status, it is, for example, in, in Poland we waited for 10 years to get a tender for, for, for a tariff and uh, for, grid, for the grid situation to get access to grid in uh, Bulgaria, in, in, in Hungary, uh, you don't get it. Yeah? Or in other countries in, in, in Europe, it is, a, it is a big, big problem. So, 
uh, I think you have different prices as well. So if you see, I give you an example, in, 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 in Romania you have one of the best wind sites and best locations for PV. <laughs> so very low uh, rate for, for, uh, for the energy pricing, if you want. But it's far away and maybe you connect it. So if you're connected, maybe you have other situations if you would do it in Germany or in other countries. So therefore you see it's a fragmented market. We looked to each country for itself. And then we invest. We are believers that something is coming up in the terms of hydrogen because we have to look for the right areas. We have to look for the permission. We have to look for grid access and to sell our energy for the best price. And therefore, it's for us important that we sell it in one hand to the energy market, the power market, in one hand to the hydrogen market. Maybe this is the business for the future. Mr. Burstoffer, you're probably not surprised about this description. This is probably your daily business. But on the other hand, I mean, if I listen to him, it seems, so I talked about our continent, our space of chances and so on, but when he's telling how his business is going, it seems as if there would not be something like a Europe. Uh, I, I, I exaggerate a little bit. But um, so what, what, what is the thinking inside the commission about um, really tackling these problems of, of the energy diversity, and that's the title of the panel. So we would like to look at, uh, I, it's definitely sure we have a, a, a lot of chances in there, but of course we see that the diversity might be of disadvantage. Uh, so what, what is your thinking inside the commission? Is, is it something the commission can really tackle, or is it something which only the council can tackle. No, I, I mean, I, I fully agree there is energy diversity and different energy mixes, and that, that's a good thing. I mean, we wouldn't want their discussion and tensions sometimes, but overall, I think what we have achieved together, and here would I slightly disagree, is that we have an internal market for electricity and gas. And if we look again, last year's crisis when there was not enough nuclear in France because half of the nuclear fleet was under reparation. It was Germany who exported electricity to France. Now that the nuclear is more or less back on schedule, it's the other way around. There is also other example where we get gas now from Belgium. In Germany, for example, last year we shouldn't forget that Germany went out of Russian gas, and overall the EU reduced from 42% of imports of Russian pipeline gas to less than 8%. And that was replaced by uh, Norway, US LNG, and many others. It was demand reduction, and it was a record year of solar and wind last year, uh, 2022, uh, with much more capacity in both in Europe. So I think there are strengths in Europe. We have interconnections between member states, maybe not enough, I agree. First of all, interconnection between Spain and France or between the Baltics and inside some countries, and I very much welcome that the suit link now, the first step is done. So permitting is an issue and the grids and the further development of grids is definitely an issue we are working on. We had a big gathering with the TSO and all the stakeholders two weeks ago in Brussels, and I think electricity grids development and, and how to improve it by permitting, by exchange of best practice, by using more efficiently the existing one and smarter. I think there are different ways we can act together. Perhaps uh, one additional question. I mean, <coughs> of course, the, con um, the connection side is, is a difficult one. You're looking at a very large continent, so with oceans in between and so on. So we have the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, we, we have, uh, of course, the Atlantic, we, we have the, um, the Mediterranean, uh, but of course, everywhere we have a lot of potential, but there is, I remember this discussion about uh, gas pipelines coming from the large LNG terminals in, on the Iberian um, Peninsula, and, and, and then you get to the French border, sorry, uh, and there is a, not a black hole, but a white, a white spot on the map. Um, and then we have all of the African um, potential of gas coming into Europe, which has to go a long way around Italy and so on. So um, what, what are your concrete, or the concrete plans to, to get this 
um, this uh, really developed? Yeah, we have just revised, and it's existing since 10 years, what we call the 10, Europe, uh, 10 European Networks for Energy, where we have a bit of money connecting Europe facility, and what we do is we select interconnectors, meaning between two countries, for electricity in the future, now for the first time for hydrogen, and we don't finance any more gas infrastructure. That is the revised Mm -hmm. Trans-European network, so the future is electricity and hydrogen. And we will select now in November the new project of common interest list, where we for the first time will have selected, I think probably something around 20 out of 180 applications. And then we have also electricity links, and we have over the years uh, good examples, like France, Spain is the Biscay Bay, it's delayed. There was co cost overrun. We have Island France Celtic interconnector started, but it takes a few years. So these, some of these projects are co-financed by us. us. Others are uh, the permitting, if you are getting the status of project of common interest, permitting is faster. But obviously, these are the big projects. There's still a lot of missing links where I think we need more, like France, Spain again, on, on gas or hydrogen in the future. We are working with the member states, including Germany, on H2MED, so the hydrogen corridor for the future. I think there is a willingness to, to come together. There are some success stories, but it takes time. And with the permitting and all the new rules, we also want to accelerate uh, this process. Well, unfortunately, time is what we do not have. If you look at our, our targets, um, Andre, um, looking at, at, at this very complicated um, atmosphere inside the European institutions, what, what is your um, thinking about how could we accelerate on this? What is necessary in the European institutions to, to really pick up the speed, which obviously they all know that we need it. We know, everybody knows we need the speed. So what could be a recipe for uh, a next commission and a next parliament uh, to, to, well, get more speed in those European processes? Well, look, uh, I think that my, my colleague here from, from El Kid is, is, is kind of mentioned the, not the, the enemies or the, the, the bad guys, but the competitors. And we are in a competitive world. We tend to think of ourselves, if you want to compare, especially these days, very much with the US. That's, that's the reality. I mean, you know, there's no need to, to, to hide behind that. The fact of the matter is that I mean, I'm Canadian, so you know, Canada is also going to work a country. But to compare the US and, and, and the EU, it's a very, very complicated story because the government is totally different. It's what, we have, uh, what we have in Europe is what we have. So we have two options. One of them is we change the treaty, which I think is an illusion right now, or we do with what we have. <coughs> and we try to adapt to what we have, to the realities of what we have. And the reality, I think the commission and, and the processes that have been put in place this at this time they're not maybe fast enough, but maybe not sufficient. But I think that we all agree that they are going into the right direction. I think that it, that would be my, my two cents. My, my impression is that we are in a world where energy is the continue. I mean, we are in a very strange world where we have a climate policy at the EU level and an energy policy which is kind of a national energy policy. So if these things are supposed to be working hand in hand, it's a very complicated story. It obviously complicates the story even further. So what you can do within the context of what you have now is reinforce the mechanism that you have. You have ACER, you have the reviews under national plans and so on. So you reinforce these and provide them additional tools to actually act on this and do re and review and, and coordinate. So you need a kind of a, a, a something to tie together all these policies, national policies, because this is the reality of Europe. If, if you know, look, I wish sometime it would be different, but we're not there, and, and we are in a situation, and this is now this is the bad part of it. The bad part of it is, yes, we have gone through this crisis, but we have two problems, Holger. One of them is a the long term, the other one is short term. The long term is that we got to invest in decarbonization, 
long-term contracts, PPAs, et cetera, et cetera, fine. But, you know, as they said, in the long term, we're all dead. So the question is, how do we get to there? And that, so that problem has been solved. So I think that is also somewhere where I think the commission and the member said are going to have a really difficult time to, to solve that, that, to address that in the short term. So you picked up your microphone. Yeah, I was spontaneously reacting to it because, yes. I mean, it's all fine and we can do certainly better, but the commission has the right of initiative and we need the agreement of the majority of the 27 EU member states. So in order to speed up, it was possible last year, but there was temporary regulation. Now we are in the final stages of a few more mm -hmm. proposals which are part of Fit for 55. And in a way, one good example here is we have a renewables directive with a very ambitious target of 42.5% for the EU member states and everyone Agreed. So we now need the governance and go there. But my initial reaction was it's all good, but without the member states, we can't do it. Yeah. So we really need the support. And normally we have it, but on some issues, it's, it's not as easy as we would sometimes wish. And that's why we are not as fast as we should be. So, Gilles Lebon, um, so it's very often when we have mixed panels, people from politics and from business, then there is a a lot of questions towards the politicians. How can we be faster? How can we do this? How can we finance this? Uh, I just would turn it around. What, what could industry bring to the table, um, really? Is there any potential do we in the business community have to talk to each other and say, look, let's, let's perhaps talk into the financial sector as well. Let's take this risk. Let's do this. Let's show it works and so on. Is this just a a romantic hope, or, or is there any potential uh, perhaps being a bit more bold as, as industries as well? Um, yeah, I will try to, to answer by saying that I think for us in the industry, what matters besides competitive access to energy and cl climate neutral uh, neutrality is all, by the way, what the industry is looking for, um, not only on scope two and, and, and scope one first. So I think there is no question about the, the, the if, it's more about the how. And for, for the industry, first of all, I would like to say what is super important is to keep it simple. Keep it simple and, and I have to say, even though I pass a lot of time in, in, in reading and, and regulation and, and laws, and I have to say, even I struggle a lot to keep pace of all what is happening. And I see many, many companies in many different countries, not only in Germany, it's in, in everywhere, that we really, really struggle. So faster, yes, but faster maybe would start with less regulation, sorry to say. I know it sounds simple, but it is, I believe, much more important to, to keep the ball rolling and then start with something that you can adjust later instead of doing everything from an ideal, typical case and, and make it very complex. So I would not look to try to keep everything we do and do it faster. I would try to say, can we not get rid of a few things or postpone them because we need first to bring you know, the car back on track. And today, I, I'm afraid to, to be a little bit, uh, not pessimistic, but I have to say that we are losing track, we are losing and speed, and if we see what we did where we started a few years back ago, we were really, I would say, in pole position in Europe, especially also in Germany, with, uh, if you look at hydrogen and many things, but today, if you look three years later, three, four years later, we are not in the pole position anymore. So I believe we really need to, to have a more technology open approach, try to limit regulation, even if we take the risk that later we might have to adjust, but let's keep it simple in the beginning to, to allow companies to, to go in this direction. Because insecurity is very bad for capital invest, investment. I think we are at the core of the, que of the issue right now. I would, um, uh, before I take Andre again and Mr. Lesser, um, so, so you described a little bit um, w what is really making your business uh, difficult. Um, so what, what, what are the, what, 
or can you imagine two or three cross-border projects which, which you really would have liked to do, but where you have the problem with regulation, very complex regulation, perhaps financing and so on? Yeah, first of all, I can only agree, keep it simple. And if you see the success from the uh, US IRI, it's very simple. Tax advantage, three cent per <coughs> kilowatt hour, uh, per kilogram H2, go for it. So very simple. So I think we need around about 500 pages to describe what we have to do and can't do. <laughs> so, uh, so therefore, there is a difference. Yeah? So, and um, I think uh, having in mind that we want to be successful and uh, that everybody uh, w see the target. At the end, we, want, we know what we want, but there are different ways to do this. I think we have to do um, a, a lot of in advance um, I had some projects, yes. Uh, I'm sometimes surprised, to be honest. Uh, I wanted to have some Polish projects with German uh, border line, and I uh, threw it over the border, and it was very complicated. So, and I saw, to my surprise, that there is not that much connection between German, German authorities and Polish authorities, and that there is not that much, even we are 100 kilometers from Berlin away. So, therefore, when I, when I talk about a European idea, I would say it would be good to think about your neighbors uh, and uh, think about how you can improve the business. And again, I, a little bit I disagree with what you said. When I see diff different energy pricing predictions in the future in different countries, then I see that there is something not really happening with the market or the connections are not there. So there might be a difference. Uh, <coughs> between the big picture and maybe France and Germany and other countries, maybe as well. Well, Andre, uh, I, I, I once heard somebody say, I don't know, I, I forgot, unfortunately, who said it, but he, he was an important person. And he said, Europe needs a simplification shock uh, in terms of, of regulation, in terms of uh, bringing back the spirit. And I think what what Chill what said is, is I mean, everybody has the impression this is, there are huge chances, there are huge markets to be developed. We are in a good position. We are world key players in, in a lot of these technologies. We invented or uh, um, photovoltaic and wind energy, and now others are doing the business, which brings us into the curve on the, the global con uh, contenders. Uh, but um, I, I mean, how can we get to such a simplification shock? I mean, I, I don't hear anybody who says, it's all fine, it has to be that slow, we need all of these regulations, but in the end they are there and they are hindering businesses and projects to happen. Well, unfortunately for people in my age group, the, the world is moving faster. The world is not moving slower. Sometimes I wish I could slow time, but it's not possible. And we don't have the luxury. I don't know, you know, I've, I've spent most of my career in business, and the think tank is kind of a late conversion in life. But what I know is that it's very easy to lose an account, and it's very difficult to sign an account. That much I know. So if we lose accounts for, for European industry, it's going to be not a cinch to get it back because there's a whole bunch of people out there ready to eat our lunch. It's just the way life is. So in, from, my, from my view, and this is probably going to be somewhat controversial, but it goes back to the fact that I entered into this climate change debate through carbon markets. That's where I came from. from but we're not talking about 2002. I'm talking about 1995, Rio. And I think that in Europe we have slightly, I would use the word, broken the balance between regulation and market. I think. That is my, my personal view. And I think that markets are imperfect. Market would be wrong. Market can be abused. But I think it was Churchill, or I can't remember, somebody said that there's, you know, we tried a lot of systems, but this is the most imperfect, but the best one that we found so far. So I, my sense would be that fl added flexibility 
not shooting for the stars right away, it's probably something we ought to think about. And I'll use an example. We think or something that hydrogen economy is the economy of the future to some degree. But we, in, by the, in order to get the hydrogen economy, you gotta get there. It doesn't have to be all green from the beginning. I think we do need the hydrogen economy, but we gotta get there and getting there just right away in green, it may just put us at disadvantage, we may not get there at all as a competitor. Now, I know this is controversial maybe, but again, it comes from a deep feeling that I think market has something to say about how we progress. I would uh, ask Chilevon again, so, I mean, Air Liquide, as everybody knows, is, is, is a big player in, in the hydrogen business, and you are having very interesting projects, Lingen and others, where you really want to go into this future. So you mentioned, of course, all of the contenders. Mr. Lesser mentioned the IRA, so that's one of the elephants in the room. Uh, bankable, very easy, uh, just take the money and invest. Um, Europe has tried to come up with, uh, with an answer and said IA, which I would say needs some development still. Uh, no, but but Chilevon, but how do you see the, uh, the competitive situation? But you, you mentioned four years ago, and I remember well when we were talking about the future of hydrogen Europe being a technolo technology leader, a born technology leader, having a lot of uh, demand. Uh, but being able to, to produce a lot of technology. What changed since then and what, what is your look at the competitors and how strong are they already on? And are we in danger of losing this momentum? So specifically on, on hydrogen, I, I indeed I think that if we look where we stood uh, three, four years ago and, and what were our ambition, I, I believe lots of what we defined by then is still intact, except that indeed it's a bit disappointing that it took us a lot of time to define, you know, the rules, how we want to, to, to implement this vision. And we are still struggling, as you know, on the different pieces of the, of the whole value chain. Um, if, if you look at what, what uh, others are doing, in, indeed the US are, are, are quite catching up fast and the RA, even though the IRA is also having its own struggle to yes. now be adapted <coughs> to reality, so let's, everything is not black and white, but I, I do believe that they are indeed, um, the US is very pragmatic and, and they will uh, probably, we shouldn't underestimate how fast they can make it a reality. But I see also a lot of other geographies, um, uh, other ones uh, in the Middle East, um, in Asia, in China, but uh, if you look at the Middle East, for example, you will see that there is also a possibility to develop the hydrogen economy to gain maybe even further parts of the value chain mm -hmm. Um, and develop its industry. And if you allow me to make one maybe last comment regarding the discussion about how can we gain on speed, I believe that if we would really look at the vision and have a common vision in Europe where we want the industry to be, and that's a difficult debate because it will transform. Some parts of the value chain will change, some will also probably seize certain activities, but we also have opportunities downstream, recycling, circular approaches, innovation, to, to you know, extend our business models, but we need to develop this vision, and once we have this vision, we can look at what are the energy systems we need to support this vision, and what kind of regulation we need. Today we do it a bit a different way. We, we start to regulate and we start to say where the energy system needs to go and then we discuss about how are we going to keep our industry. So I plead for another approach to say let's work on the vision where we want to be and how do we then create the right circumstances and conditions to allow this vision. I would end so we have a, a minute left but I mean you had the, the, the part, as always, so the one politician on the panel. Uh, I saw you nodding, I saw you <laughs> shaking your head at times. So I would give you um, the, the last uh, say here on the, on the panel. 
so what, where do you see the EU going? Are we Are going to have this election next year, which might cause a certain political shift in the parliament, um, which obviously would have impacts on a, on a next commission and setting up an, a next commission. Uh, but what, from your perspective, what do you think would be the major uh, issues uh, a next commission should have, should pick up to keep us competitive, to make us these technology leaders we always are envisioning ourselves and to keep us resilient? Yeah. I think, and that is where you started in a way, I think we are now finishing a couple of Fit for 55 files. But I think you can already feel also from the speech from the president, but also from the debate here, that competitiveness and industrial policy and less regulation is a little bit the themes mm. also the new commission will pick up. I'm, I'm sure that, and in a way it's good that we had now a cycle of regulation more or less adopted, and that gives us time to think and also see where we can improve, where we can make it more simple, what are the real challenges for industry, the grids, the permitting, what can we do as EU together, but what is at national level, because on taxes we cannot give any rebates at EU level, this is a national matter, so we can differentiate, but in a way the elections are important, and I, I fully agree that we should all promote whatever we can on the values we have there, and then we will also, and we're already starting preparing for a new commission, and we should use that time and your input from industry, BDI, and, and key players are now very useful because it's now that we will have these dialogues. The new Vice President Shevchevich will have a few industrial dialogues, and we will really look. There's a big package in the energy and climate, so we won't start with new legislation, but what can we do? more, better on the enabling framework, on exchange of best practice. I think that's also a strong part because we know more or less what's happening in the 27 EU member states, so we can uh, facilitate that. So there are a couple of things we can do, but I think we are also in a listening mood right now uh, in order to prepare for that. Thank you. Well, thank you to, uh, to my panel. I think it was good that we ended this, this Congress on, on the European note. You, you might see that there are not so many differences in the mood in Germany and in Europe, which would be obviously uh, very interesting if it would be totally different. Uh, but we also that uh, Europe is still the space for chances. Uh, we need to pick up speed. We need, and I I say it again, sort of a simplification shock, and we have to be very vigilant if we look at our competitors who are not always with very fair means trying to, to overtake us. But IRA is going to be a funny story in two, three years. This is not going to be very easy as it looks now. Thank you, and then... Ganz herzlichen Dank. Okay. <lacht>